Well, it is my pleasure uh, and honor to uh, welcome everybody to this uh, seminar, uh, this two-day digital conference uh, dedicated to classical music and its future. Uh, and uh, with the important title of the sustainable development of classical music. We're all here to discuss ways to secure a future of performance. And it builds upon the work and the important work of the Global Music Education League. And it builds on the work of the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts and its recent work with UNESCO and its Resiliart movement. I wish to uh, welcome everybody and I wish to pay a, a, a very warm thank you to Ambassador Suazo and the entire team at UNITAR in New York for making this conference possible. We will be together for two days, today and tomorrow. The first half of each day will be um, uh, moderated by the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts, of which I am president. And we'll look and invite roundtable discussions with experts on the topics of professional development for musicians and young artists, international marketing, and also looking at the role and future role of international music competitions. In the second half of each day, I am very honored to be uh, sharing the platform with the annual meeting of the Global Music Education League whose president is Professor Wang and whose membership counts, I believe, at the last count, 72 member institutions around the world. Uh, one of whom I'm very happy to see is an Australian like myself. Uh, so good, well, very good evening to Sydney. Um, these discussions in a year such as this has been uh, absolutely vital for ensuring a future for classical music that is performed and live and prepared for and adapted for. So I'm uh, very uh, proud that the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts is able to uh, present this uh, um, uh, conference in partnership with UNITAR and the Global Music Education League. I thank everybody involved. And I wish to pass the floor now to uh, Ambassador Suazo, head of office in New York for UNITAR. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Benjamin, for these kind kind words. For UNITAR uh, be associated with uh, uh, the um, Global Foundation for Performing Arts and the Music Education League in order to uh, promote, uh, in order to um, enhance, and in these particular times of this uh, pandemic which have a, such a negative impact in all of us, but in particular in the performance arts, is, is a real uh, honor to be part of this uh, uh, initiative. Um, do you know the uh, title of the, this uh, event is uh, Sustainable Development and Classical Music Securing the Future of Performance. The United Nations uh, General Assembly in 2015 approved a, a paramount agenda for sustainable development and one of the core issues of that agenda is the United Nations we want and the United Nations we need. Uh, it's a very inclusive uh, agenda. And I see the similarities on what we are looking uh, on uh, achieve on the performing arts, in particular classical music and music um, as a whole. So it's, it's, it's a pleasure. Uh, it has been uh, um, through uh, our dear friend Lucia Wow. Uh, working before uh, putting together these uh, events uh, in the past and we see the, the value of it because uh, performing arts and music arts are at the soul of the human development and the United Nations cannot achieve human development uh, leaving uh, behind or leaving outside uh, the performing arts. Uh, we are born with this uh, uh, is in our genetic code to communicate to art, uh, performing art, uh, music, uh, paint, or interpretation. Uh, so it is a real honor and a pleasure to be among you all uh, uh, today. Uh, I know that we have a very rich program, as you described, Benjamin, and I know that uh, we're going to have a different session tomorrow, 
but the paramount of the uh, scope of this meeting goes for on every corner of the world from Georgia to Sydney to many other places uh, is, 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 is very, very, very important. So uh, we are, we are uh, honored to be here and to uh, send this uh, motivation word. Uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 has put a uh, lockdown in major cities of the world. Just here in New York, Carnegie Hall, uh, the Lincoln Center has been shut down for almost a year now. And I don't know what is the fate of those artists that perform in those centers, you know. Uh, on the other hand, has also shown how the human spirit is, is, is uh, resilient. And I see when I was walking around the city of New York during the lockdown that by March, April, May, how many people came out who was having as a profession performing art, playing music through the balconies, uh, delivering messages, interpreting uh, characters in order to motivate other uh, human beings to be optimistic and to be uh, uh, you know, resilient and to fight for. Uh, that's I saw it in Wuhan also at the beginning of the pandemic. I saw it in Italy, I saw it in, in Spain. And, and so this is so important that we have to uh, share this message. We have to uh, do this kind of event and we have to look ways in order to uh, achieve uh, uh, the uh, uh, securing that uh, the arts, performing arts, music and classical music stay on, uh, stay uh, with us uh, forever. So I wanted to uh, uh, give this a small, uh, a small talk because we are in a very difficult uh, uh, situation. Um, I, I, I hope uh, that by the end of this uh, two, two day session, we will be able to uh, achieve uh, uh, what we were looking for, which is disseminate the message, keep in touch among ourselves and, uh, and promote, promote universally the music, the classical music and the performer, uh, uh, performance art. I am very happy to see Professor Li Wan Wan with us. And um, I wanted to pay tribute to, to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the academic. Uh, all the panelists that are with us are the leading uh, directors of uh, music academies around the world and universities and things like that. So very renowned. So I, don't want it to go through uh, every single name. I don't want it to forget anyone because there are about 15, 20 plus other people that are uh, online with us today. So thank you all for being with us today and for sharing that, uh, that, that message. Uh, for the Global uh, Foundation of Performing Art, thank you very much for being uh, with us. To Lucia for being the spearhead of, this, of these activities of this program. We recognize that uh, and you can count with the United Nations, with uh, uh, my agency, in any in any kind of uh, support you may need it uh, to do these events, because uh, we are honored to be part of it. As I said, the United Nations cannot live uh, uh, without uh, uh, the performance art elements on the sustainable development agenda, and that is crucial for us. And we will continue to support these activities. I will stop here for the benefits of time, and because I know. We have a very heavy uh, um, program, uh, but uh, I hundred percent sure that we will enjoy that. Uh, thank you once again, uh, and thank you to uh, uh, Professor Wan and to you, uh, Benjamin, for for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you. It is very important for all of us working in the performing arts that we have opportunities to really bring our voice and uh, play our advocacy role to policy makers and decision makers. And particularly this year, I'm very proud and happy that we're able to uh, have our meeting in this format linked directly with international policy makers. Thank you. I would like to pass the floor for a short welcome message to Professor Wang. Uh, to welcome the delegates before we begin the conference. Professor Wang, please. Thank you, Professor. 
全球音乐教育联盟二零二零年年会胜利的召开。所以在这里呢，我向我们的朋友们致以早上好、中午好、晚上好。在这个全球共同面对疫情的艰难时刻，我们都深刻的感受到，虽然在政治领域、世界范围的交流与合作遭遇了重大挑战，然而。音乐呢，将我们紧紧的连接在一起，让我们能够跨越时间与时空，冲破一切的隔阂，在艺术领域紧密的相连。时光飞逝，二零一七年九月十号，全球音乐教育联盟在我们的共同倡议下在北京成立。我作为联盟理事会的亚洲代表的同时。也有幸被推选为全球音乐教育联盟的主席。其他理事分别有美国伊斯曼音乐学院院长贾马尔·罗西教授、芝加哥大学音乐学院院长安妮·罗宾森教授、芬兰西贝柳斯音乐学院院长卡尔洛·希尔德教授和澳大利亚悉尼音乐学院院长安娜·瑞德教授来担任。在过去的三年中啊。我们精诚团结，始终秉承着努力推动世界范围内不同音乐文化、音乐学院以及素质教育的建立与传承发展这样的一个宗旨和使命，不断的加强合作、和平、开放、包容、相互互鉴、互利共赢。在文化领域的交流与协作中的落实，搭建国际化青年人才培养、教学、科研、资源建设的平台，创建符合未来发展趋势的国际化音乐及音乐素质的教育体系，推动世界各族人民的音乐的发展，促进各国文化之间的取长补短。以音乐艺术的独特魅力，消除隔阂，纯净心灵，让音乐呢成为世界和平的使者。全球音乐教育联盟成立以来，坚持创新，推出高规格的品牌活动。我们每年举办的全球音乐院校校长交流季，即联盟年会，被誉为高等教育领域的。联合国大会，二零一九年由联盟各成员院校携手创办的中国国际音乐大赛，历时十五天，也成为了世界一流音乐赛事阵营中的重要成员。全球音乐教育联盟的发展目标，从来都不是只为一所学校或者个别院校提供益处。而是始终致力于加强联盟全体成员院校之间的合作，使得全体联盟成员共同获益。因此，我们不断探索高层次复合型世界顶尖音乐人才培养的新机制，制定跨国、跨校、跨学科的人才联合培养方案，积极的探索依托于互联网新技术的音乐人才培养机制。充分利用现代信息技术，实现全球优质教学资源开放共享。依托全球音乐教育联盟这样一个平台啊，我们共创了高水平音乐人才培养的这个本科，二加二，研究生，一加一，四加二等国际联合培养模式。目前，众多受益于这一联合培养模式的学生。正在世界各国的顶尖音乐学府之间交流学习，我们相信，他们之中未来一定会诞生传承人类音乐文明的大师和巨匠。毫无疑问，全球音乐教育联盟具有全球唯一性、音乐教育高端合作的首创性。未来，我们将继续依托于这一。
啊，常设的主子，将全球音乐教育联盟、校长交流季、中国音乐大赛等系列合作，包括人才联合培养等常态化，举办呢全球院校的学院奖等一系列的其他活动，促进丰富有益的互学互鉴。最后，在这里呢，我也特别想感谢联合国训练研究所的马可·苏亚菲阁下，以及全球表演艺术基金会的本杰明·伍德罗夫先生、郭·鲁西亚女士，与我们全球音乐教育联盟一起，共同筹备了这次线上交流的盛会。我代表目前已达到百家成员的单位的。全球音乐教育联盟向在线的各位朋友发出邀请，我希望你们能够加入全球音乐教育联盟。我也真诚的想邀请大家来中国，来中国音乐学院做客。也希望我们之间啊，能碰撞出合作的火花，建立起新的交流合作机制，培养、探索、培养人才。音乐研究以及传播普及的新模式，共同推动全球音乐教育迈上新台阶，为我们人类文明和谐共生与世界和平发展做出更大的贡献。在此，我再一次预祝全球表演艺术基金会、古典音乐发展及战略高峰论坛及。全球音乐教育联盟二零二零年的年会取得圆满成功，谢谢大家。Thank you, Professor Wang. Thank you very much for outlining the vision and work of the Global Music Education League,、uh, and we are very proud of this dialogue and this continued work that、uh, we've been working together. And I'm sure that I'm looking forward to hearing In more detail,、uh, the voices of your members and particularly your council members about、uh, upcoming priorities on the GML、uh, agenda. It now,、uh, I am very honoured to be introducing a. I believe we have a、uh, video message to open the、um, the conference, our two-day conference. We are fortunate to have a video message from the、um, the Hungarian permanent representative,、uh, chair of the Social, Humanitarian, and Cultural Committee of Hungary to the United Nations, and I would like、uh, to share her voice with all of us this morning. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Good morning, everybody. I come from a land where artists, writers, scientists. And musicians have paved the way of the people, not only the Hungarian people, not only the European people, but the people of the world. And I learned my motto from one of the greatest Hungarian composers of 20th century, Béla Bartók. He wrote, "My guiding philosophy." Has always been the idea of different nations uniting into brotherhood, in spite of all the wars and hostility. I have tried to serve the aim of this idea as best as I can in my music. So, for that reason, I don't shrink away from any influences. A very United Nations idea before the United Nations was born. And yes, I see our space as a cultural space, where cultures influence each other, inspire each other. I see this cultural space as a jewelry box full of unsuspected jewels. But we have to be open to observe all these jewels. Of course, during COVID times, one thinks, "What is happening to art 
what is happening to classical music, but really, we couldn't have survived the most difficult times without classical music. We listened to the concerts, we watched the streamed opera performances, and this music gave us hope. Being originally a pianist, I immediately envisaged this COVID time as a pause at the end of every line of the musical score. Because this pause means that the composer wants us to think what happened so far to us and wants us to be ready and open for the continuation. COVID is this pause. And this pose has been filled with classical music and classical musicians and gave us hope when we saw them playing together from all over the world. This is the real dialogue. The real dialogue is the quartet and the octet and the orchestra. Because if the musicians are not listening to each other, there is chaos, there is no harmony. But of course, in these COVID times, there is a lot of creativity going on. First of all, I think the composers are working. So we don't know yet what we will hear. We don't know yet how they see this time in their music. So I'm very much looking forward to that. But also, we see different versions of creation during the online world. And don't forget, always, if something new came up, was a kind of a continuation of the old, but was also a hope and an idea coming from the future. Just think that the first photo was set just like a still life painting or the letters of the Gutenberg Bible resembled handwritings in an old codex, or the first automobiles imitated a coach, and the first video phone simulated television. So I hope that everything what's happening to us and to classical music is a new way of creativity. We will move on preserving what we've got in this pose, but also being open and creating towards the future. And yes, I would love to sit in the concert halls. I would love to breathe together with the musicians and the conductor. But so far, classical music has saved us. Thank you very much for these very warm words from Ambassador Bogge from Hungary, a perm ambassador to the permanent mission of the United Nations in New York. Um, we have uh, a lot to discuss in these two days. And I'm now shifting our attention to the first part of our sessions, our panels this morning, which is a... Um, a roundtable discussion uh, regarding professional development, artist mentorship, and training. We have two. Uh, we have a, great, a strong commitment in this conference to education, music education, full stop, be it through conservatories and the Global Music Education, music education League, but also there are other types of education for musicians and ways of forming uh, career professionals that exist in the music landscape. And this morning, uh, I'm looking forward to this uh, open discussion uh, regarding career development, international marketing, other ways of assisting um, musicians of the highest levels after they have left and uh, completed their, their, their tertiary institutional training. Um, I will spend some time tomorrow explaining the vision and mission of the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts to put this in broader context. But I'm delighted now to, uh, to welcome uh, our panelists for this morning's session. Um, 
what I would like to do is uh, we have four panelists. Uh, we have um, in alphabetical order, uh, Oliver Condy, who is the editor of BBC Music Magazine. Um, and we are joined also by Jeffrey John Davies, the founder and CEO of the Violin Channel. We're also joined by uh, Kirill Trusov, violinist, teacher, um, chamber musician, uh, performer. And I'm also delighted that we are joined by Adam Gatehouse, uh, currently director of the Leeds International Piano Competition. But prior to that, a long history of working with um, uh, uh, BBC and uh, radio producing concerts and, young art and driving young artist schemes. I believe that this combination of looking at tertiary education and education beyond tertiary education is incredibly valuable. Tomorrow morning, we'll be speaking with competition directors about their vision and their role and what they see is happening at the moment and how they're adapting for uh, making sure that there's a role for competitions to discover new talent um, going forward. But this morning, I think it's appropriate uh, that we start with uh, a musician. We're all musicians to some degree, but I think I would like to open the floor first to Kirill. Um, and Kirill, if you could un... Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's very important to, 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 uh, to, to begin with musicians. And Kirill, I'd like to uh, share with you some thoughts. You have a... a you're a performing violinist, um, a professional violinist, touring, performing. But one thing that has very much struck me is that you've taken um, a very strong um, interest and you've developed a teaching program, actually more than one type of teaching programs, uh, that are not aligned specifically with a particular institution or a conservatory but it's something that you've developed in response to your own masterclasses. And now under this period of COVID, you've adapted the way you're teaching to something that I think is very interesting and very um, uh, um, important for us to hear. I wondered um, if you could say something about how you, how you balance the two, teaching and performing, uh, and why you've really made such a commitment into this space. Uh... Hello, I'm uh, very happy to be part of this uh, meeting. It's uh, great that we can share our ideas at this very strange times in this world and we are all affected by this situation. So coming uh, to your question, um, yes, um, I'm a concert violinist and uh, I do a lot of masterclasses. I teach 20 years and uh, through my international masterclasses, which also before COVID, um, um, I had many applications and some people couldn't arrive to my master classes due to visa problems or uh, travel problems. Um, so more and more people were a bit disappointed they couldn't join uh, join my master classes. So uh, the idea for my online platform, which I established last year, came actually through this. So I wanted to be able to um, to be there for my students all around the world at any time. And uh, COVID has changed our life uh, in culture and education. And uh, the digital, um, the digital things are happening today to our society. It's in every day's life. So what I realized is that um, the new communication, what we do today with Zoom and Skype, can connect the world in seconds. I mean, imagine we're sitting here with all the nations and talking about uh, the topics we have. Um, and uh, so now I've established this platform and uh, the good thing and an incredible thing that I see so many students registering. Um, not only which are students, but also violinists who ask me questions in regarding marketing, regarding websites, regarding how to make your career, um, any sorts of questions. Of course, we mainly work, I mainly work on violin and technique, but um, my platform is open for everybody. And uh, it's just great to see with how much inspiration and how much happiness the student join. I notice, Kirill, uh, when I visit and when I've been speaking with you and when I visit your site that your classes are um, booked, as in your time is limited, but your classes, are, your online classes are, 
um, are obviously selling out. There's a there's a there's a reason, or there's a yeah. there's a call and a response. Um, would you say, in percentage terms, how much time is spent on violin technique training, and how much time is spent on um, general advice, career advice, uh, guidance, mentorship? Of course. Um... You have students which uh, which are new students coming to the platform, and you have uh, students who come every week. Of course, if somebody comes for one or two lessons, uh, mainly it's technique things which you work and you speak about music, about uh, but about te technical things in violin. But if a student, and this is what I see more and more coming in uh, every week or every two weeks, of course, there are coming up questions. How can I deal with, uh, um, what can I do with my art? How, how can I establish my profile? How can I do uh, online marketing? How um, how do I do videos? Where do I start? And this all these questions, which include also um, in my on my platform apart. From teaching. You have uh, you were uh, mentored yourself by uh, Yehudi Menuhin and uh, other leading um, violinists. Do you feel that it is your role now to return some of the uh, mentorship to to other? It, uh, knowledge sharing becomes becomes a role as a as a as a musician to keep uh, a future of performance. Is there anything yes. there that that perhaps is coming through? Yeah, I think that uh, generally a professor education is is a shortened way from A to B. For example, um, of course, a student can search for a result himself. He probably will need, uh, depending on what you look for, maybe two weeks, maybe one month, maybe. But through experience of a teacher, throughout his teachers before, we can pass on um, our knowledge uh, to the next generation. That's why we have better products, we have better educations, we, are, we learn from the past, and uh, society always has learned from the past. So I think it's on every teacher's uh, life to give, to give what you learn to the next generation. And uh, I'm very happy that, um, um, I can help so many students around the world and uh, also in some parts of the world still the lockdown is very strong so this they, they're so happy to see somebody on the other side and uh, um, just um, apart from the teaching also to have somebody who they can ask questions and uh, get support that's uh, that's what I see and uh, technical uh, capacity to teach using zoom and using the platforms we have you you you're finding it uh, fulfilling or uh, possible to to make a difference Yes, uh, you have. You need to have good equipment. You have to have good lightning, good uh, good cameras, mics, and everything. This has to be settled, and of course, good internet connections. But in uh, most of the countries, uh, we are on a good standard. Uh, what I see, I have seen extremely, is that United States and China is very ahead. When I teach from Germany, my my base is in Munich, and uh, sometimes I teach students here in Europe, and then I teach students in China. And the connection of uh, the connection is sometimes better in China and the States than throughout Europe, and I'm sitting in Europe here. So that's a very interesting fact what I'm following. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I, I can really see and I imagine that you're uh, going to be uh, inundated with more and more uh, lessons. Turning to uh, another um, expert in the field and keeping in the same uh, instrument discipline, I'd like to uh, speak with Jeffrey Davies from the Violin Channel. Uh, hey. Jeffrey, one, uh, well, there are many things we could talk about, but one aspect, one of the principal reasons that I believe uh, you have such, uh, su such, um, so many things to contribute at this point is you, you're a violinist yourself uh, and you established the Violin Channel in 2009. So you've, you've, you've had time to sort of position it and, and adapt to it and you had a particular vision for what the violin channel could be which was mostly an internet based uh, entity but you've also taken a leap not just in the marketing terms you've taken a leap in the in the vc artist program and really sort of guiding and mentoring a violinist that you've identified uh, or that your team has identified as promising talents um, how are you managing professional development and have things changed this year uh, in res are you getting different questions this year as you were in previous years? Yes. Good morning, Benjamin, Carol, Adam, Ollie. Hey. <laughs> Greetings from New York City. Uh, nice to see all you guys again. It's, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, so Benjamin, as you were saying, um, I did found the website in 2009 and, um, you know, it was sort of a, a leap of faith that was all sort of, you know, all very new. And I guess people weren't doing dig digital 
um, magazines back then, but I sort of just dived in. And I, I guess I always found the most interesting aspect of what we're doing was, you know, working with young artists. And, you know, I was a very young artist then as well when I started this. And, and you know, just, um, you know, trying to create this new generation of, you know, superstar. So I think right from the very beginning, we're very focused on um, working with young artists and sort of helping them, you know, give them, giving them the tools that, you know, they needed to be a successful artist. So, you know, helping them develop an online profile, helping them with exposure, um, helping them with feedback and ways they can improve, introductions to instruments, um, instru introductions to management, you know, giving, the, giving them those aspects from it. So I think, I don't know, I, I personally find that the most interesting part of what I do. And I also, you know, find it the most rewarding. So it's always been a, a big part of what we do. Um, has that changed during COVID? No, I, I don't really think it has. I think if anything, um, you know, everything has sort of crystallized on online. And I think we've been in a, in a nice position because, you know, even a lot of the really large establishments like Carnegie Hall and the New York Philharmonic here in New York, that sort of, they're coming to us now saying, okay, we're in a, a little bit of a, a jam with not having the venues open. How can we collaborate? How can we, how can we do that? How can we stream our content? So I, I think, um, I think I, I feel fortunate that we sort of did get that digital footprint early and it, and it, it sort of, um, you know, served a, a nice platform during this period. So, and I think if anything, we have just amplified what we've been doing during this period. So, you know, with the VC Young Artists, there's 25 in total that, you know, we work very closely with. If anything, during this period, they've been in contact with us more saying, what can I do? How can I do that? And, you know, I've got this new initiative. I'm starting a podcast. And I'm like, yeah, sure, we can amplify it for you and, and things like that. So I would say, if anything, um, it's just been slightly more uh, intense during this period. Um, I wanted to ask another question. You you have a strong commitment to um, following academies, following competitions, following not just concert performances and recordings. You, you, you've got a real shift of what's happening in the in the in the industry, so to speak, in the sector of right. the string world. Mm -hmm. um, how, without giving away everything, how do you choose your 25 VC artists? I'd be very interested to know what your, you know, who do you, how do you choose who you invest in uh, to, the, to that degree? You don't have to reveal all, but please feel free to uh, share. I, I think because we work with, we work with most of the major competitions, like most of the major competitions, I am there in the audience, you know, that's why I know a lot of you guys, because, you know, all of the major competitions, I am there, I'm in the audience, I'm there for the final. And I think even the, even the next tier down, you know, we're now at the point where we're partnering and, and streaming most of them. So between myself and my team, you know, we'll sit here in the office when there'll be a stream, a competition on, we'll be on the TV right behind us. We'll be talking about that. We'll be watching. And then I think, um, I think from that point, you know, I, I do obviously see a lot of, a lot of candidates and it's just who really kind of moves me and who really, I really connect with. And it's much more than just being technically proficient. It's like, you know, I've, I've met them. I've had, conversations with them I can see that they're very personable I could see that presenters would like them I could see that I would be proud to introduce them to an in instrument donor that they you know they can answer emails they can you know they can do all the basics on top of being very very technically um, across what they're doing as well as having something to say and um, yeah and I, I just I naturally find that they just you know and, and I, I'm usually seeing them four five six ten times before we're featuring someone and, and you know, they kind of just pop up and then it, and it seems that, you know, my team have the same opinion. So, you know, um, Brian and my content team who, who manages all the competition, you know, he'll always come to me and say, oh my God, I love, you know, and we, we have very similar, very similar tastes. So I think, I think they just naturally, they naturally pop up with the major bursaries and the major competitions and we've met them and, you know, they have their respect to their peers as well. And, you know, all of these important factors that go into making a career are far more than just winning a competition one. So, um, I don't know. I don't. I don't find it overly difficult. Somehow they just pop up, and we're all excited about them. And I. And I. And I think. And I think the selection. You know, looking at it now for over the ten years, the selection's been pretty right. You know, they. You know, whether it's chicken before <laughs> egg, or but you know, you look at you look at the ones that are having major careers now. You know, the Ray Chen, Kian, Kian Fultani, Pablo Fernandez, I'm sorry, Kim. You know, these these were artists that we have been working with since they were you know teenagers, and we're like, okay, how can we help this and you know, obviously they've done all the right things with their playing and with their, with their promotion and with their management and all of that. But, you know, I think, um, I think our instincts have been pretty good. I would agree. I'm not here to, uh, 
challenge the decisions. I'm I'm interested in the in the in the discovery process. I'm interested mm -hmm. in where you um, go for your mm -hmm. uh, you know how it work for you. Um, I, I while we have um, directors of music institutions uh, on in, on in, in, on the conference here. Uh, how what is your so how much time do you spend with conservatories and how much time are you able to actually um, mm -hmm. vote to that to that important aspect of music education? Well, I, would, I would say um, I do work very close like I'm obviously based in in New York but and I, I sort of I'm up at the Juilliard School quite often with things and often young artists that you know are in our program or in our periphery will say oh I have my graduation recital Jeffrey could you come to this and 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 so I think on top of on top of competitions, I am sort of accepting invites to go to go to concerts, you know, that are in my area, and I, you know, I am going to to Curtis and Juilliard and MEC quite regularly for for various things and 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 seeing. Um, I just thought of one instance. I was at the Menuhin competition in Austin in 2014, and this um, I'd never heard this young player before, and he came on. He's probably about 16, and I just sat there. You know, I'd been sitting in. Through the whole first round was 40, 40 recitals and you sort of you know you can you can sort of get a feel and all of a sudden everything stood up and i was just like who is this kid i cannot believe it and i kind of ran backstage immediately after the first round and i said um i don't know if you follow the side but we we would love to feature you like I, I had this instant reaction and you know he's gone on to, he won the paganini competition after that and he's gone on to have a very good a very good career but i don't know it was like it was just this instant you know i'd never even seen him online before then so i think a lot of it's just gut feeling or you know thank you jeffrey i think that uh it's a perfect fit to bring in uh, adam gatehouse from uh the uk uh good afternoon adam and uh jeffrey's last response about um responding immediately knowing the talent knowing the artistic vision recognizing uh, a, a musician when you see one has, was a was a large part of your career and I wondered if you might reflect on professional development, artist mentorship, uh, on the two angles. One, one with your with the work with BBC and new generation, new artists, new artist generation, and also uh, with the Leeds competition and how you're looking at that next year and the and the and the differences you've been making there. Okay, hello everybody, um, and welcome from a grey but okay London. It's not raining which is nice. Um, okay, well, if I start with the BBC New Generation Artist Scheme, which I started 21 years ago, um, that was a non-competitive scheme, actually. Uh, it had a very simple selection mechanism. I chose them, and which is uh, <coughs> hugely undemocratic in, in many ways, but um, I think I was pretty fair. And the whole idea was to find <coughs> young artists who were on the cusp of international careers. And it was anything, pianists, quartets, singers, mm. violinists, um, tuba players even, and jazz musicians as well. And really to help them by giving them what they need most, which is performance and recording opportunities. And <clears throat> the BBC has and had then and still has fantastic facilities at its disposal. So we could do that. And I think that the, probably the, 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 the best thing that, that we could do for them was to take them into the studio. Most of them had never been in the studio before and hold their hand and teach them that this is not a hostile environment and that the microphone is there to help them and teach them how to, how to make recordings proper recordings, not, not just playthroughs, but proper recordings. And I think that was a, 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 a big thing for, for all of them. They always said, they all said that that was one of the most important things. I mean, I remember with the, the very young Lisa Batyashvili, she was just 18 and she was literally shaking when she came into the studio and says, what do I do, what do I do? So I, I just held her hand and I pointed to the microphone and I said, listen, that is your best friend. And just think of it as if you've just invited your very best friend who you trust and know and love into the studio to hear you play, to support you. And, um, and I think that sort of helped her across that, across that hump. Um, I would say that with the, with the leads, it's a different thing because of course it is a competition. Um, and although I have a, quite a skeptical uh, 
attitude to competitions. I mean, I can see that, I obviously can see their value. And since I'm artistic director of one of the world's top ones, I have to, but um, I don't think they're the only way, but uh, when Paul Lewis and I started the re-envisaging of the leads, if you like, five years ago, one thing we wanted to really stress about it was to make it uh, a humane competition, one in which people came, okay, of course they're coming to compete, but they also came to learn and to be able to go away feeling that they had more inside them to help them with their careers. And so, for instance, we get um, people from the industry, managers, people from marketing, people from PR to come in and talk to them. I mean, very important, for instance, one of the things that I think is really important is for any young artist is not just to have management, but to how to manage your manager. Um, you know, that, that, that's actually a, a, a very important thing. Some managements are very, very sympathetic to younger artists and will help nurture them. Others, less so. And, and you know, it, it, it's, that is quite an important part of, of, of where you are. The other thing, of course, is mentoring. And we, we do offer mentoring to, to, to our prize winners. So for instance, the, the, the winner from 2018, Eric Liu, um, he's had mentoring from Mari Pariah, from Mitsuko Uchida, and from Imogen Cooper over the last two years. And, and you know, that has, I know, has been an enormous thing for him um, because mentoring is different from teaching. I mean, as everybody would agree, you know, uh, a mentor is not there to teach you how to play a piece particularly. They're there to help you on the broader, how to, how to really get your musical feelings across in the best possible way. And, and it, it covers all sorts of things as to how you present yourself on stage, you know, and even how you take a bow, um, which you know, only, only people like that can, can, can help them with. So I think there's a lot of, other things that we can all <coughs> all do um, and particularly in something like a competition I know you're talking about competitions tomorrow and unfortunately I can't join you then but but I think that there are many other things too that, that go into it marketing is another and of course the whole online thing which which hey listen they can teach me a lot more about that than I can teach them so you know <laughs> well Adam I thank you very much for your comments and I I I, I wish to wrap up uh, this this roundtable discussion just by, you know, by thanking, by thanking you, Kirill Trusov, you, Jeffrey D John Davies, you, Adam Gatehouse, uh, for the work that you're all doing uh, post uh, ed post tertiary education, and I think it highlights the balance of a of, of, of holistic training that is required for the securing of musicians and securing of future performances uh, in our sector. So I thank you very much for your time and your wisdom and you're very welcome to stay on as we move through to the second part of this morning which is the annual meeting of the Global Music, Music Education League and I pass the floor to Professor Wang. Thank you very much. Well, 而且我听到了刚才三位的发言都非常精彩表演艺术基金会新时代的高等音乐教育国际化与多边合作在后疫情世界中的作用
卡尔洛·希尔德教授。Thank you very much, President Wang, and thank you for the opportunity to meet you all, and also the very interesting discussion that we've now started. So in this presentation, I will start by highlighting, highlighting two trends that have a profound impact on the situation in which higher music education institutions are at the moment, and continue with looking at some possible consequences of the pandemic on international networks, such as the Gmail. The first of the two trends is internationalization. <clears throat> During the last 30 years, internationalization has become a strategic concern and a key change agent in higher education all over the world. Um, one of the manifestations of this change is student mobility. We've experienced a five-fold increase in the number of students studying outside their country of citizenship over the last 30 years. Our institutions have become more connected and multicultural giving our students a much more diverse and interesting learning environment. But we've also seen a gradual paradigm shift from cooperation to competition. International education has become an industry, a source of revenue and a means for enhanced reputation. A second trend <clears throat> affecting our current situation is the rapid expansion of higher education in the music and the arts over the last 50 years with an ever increasing number of graduates entering the labor market with the degree in the arts. Literary, every aspect of music has been embraced by the academe. According to a report from 2014, out of the 2 million arts graduates in the US, only 10% make their primary earnings as working artists. Given the discrepancy between employment opportunities within the arts and number of arts graduates, as well as the rising costs of tuition at art schools, graduates are facing a more and more challenging and multifaceted job market with intensive global competition and portfolio careers. And then suddenly we have the COVID. <clears throat> the arts sector, but especially the performing arts, um, have taken a severe hit. In Finland alone, around, <clears throat> around 9,000 musicians have lost their jobs or have been laid off. According to a Swedish study, ticket sales have dropped 90%, constituting a loss around 60% of the total income in the music sector. In a survey conducted in Great Britain, 64% of musicians consider leaving the profession. We've been really innovative in trying to create models of performing and teaching online, but it remains still a huge challenge to make performances artistically interesting online and simultaneously create some revenue, create some revenue out of them. Out of them. So all of this urges us to think whether it's really realistic to think that we can continue along the lines set by these trends of internationalization and expansion I described earlier. In my view, we have at least two big tasks that require our, our attention in the current landscape. Firstly, we need to actively engage in research in initiatives that help us to understand the many ways in which the pandemic has changed our fields. The things that we have learned, the challenges that have risen, the solutions that have been invented, the support institutions and professionals need in coping with the future. And we also need to invest in developing new curricula and in creating professional development programs to meet these needs. Somebody said that there has been more innovation going on during the last six years than during the last hundred years in higher education. But most of it has been ad hoc problem solving without a clear direction or vision of how the future could look like. Together, we need to help the all uh, individual music institutions, professionals, and also our staff and students to find their roles um, in the landscape that has changed almost beyond recognition. Secondly, I think we need to reconsider our views on international collaboration. My view is that we need to focus less on competition, reputation management, rankings, and mobility numbers, 
and more on how we could best make use of the somewhat dormant collaborative power and collective expertise that lies in our international networks. The knowledge, resources and creativity needed to rebuild the music profession and the sector after the pandemic requires a lot from the universities in terms of educational, artistic and technological innovation. The goals that we need to strive towards are too challenging for any institution operating alone. We need to strengthen our capacity to tackle the huge problems and utilize the interesting opportunities that this rebuilding process of the post-COVID era brings before us. So to wrap up um, the Jamel, <clears throat> I feel that the Jamel has <clears throat> the true potential to play an important role in helping us to find new models of international collaboration <clears throat> and to join forces in developing our institutions to meet the many needs of our societies. Music and art is needed more than ever, but never before has the ways in which this can most fruitfully happen been so uncertain and open for new initiatives. This is our momentum to act together. Thank you very much.你提出的三个问题他就是伊斯曼音乐学院院长接下来呢，我们就请为我们全球教育联盟也是做出突出贡献的理事啊，贾马尔罗西，就国际合作的机机会拓展来进行主旨发言。有请，贾马尔，有请。Thank you so much, Presidents Wong and Woodruff, Ambassador Salzo, and valued colleagues. Greetings from Rochester, New York. It is a pleasure to be with you for this virtual concert and an honor to have this opportunity to speak with you. It is said that when a door closes, a window sometimes opens. While the COVID-19 pandemic has been unimaginably disruptive to the operations of our schools, new windows of opportunity for international collaboration have now emerged. Before exploring these opportunities, let's take a moment to think about the experience of the last eight months. The American composer Aaron Copland once said, to stop the flow of music would be like the stopping of time itself, incredible and inconceivable. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic this past spring, it seems like that is precisely what happened, that music and time stopped. For professional musicians in the United States, virtually all work ceased as performance venues closed. Outdoor stadiums that host tens of thousands of concert goers to bars and restaurants that might hold a few hundred patrons were dark. From concert halls and opera houses to churches and coffee houses, everything closed down. Likewise, the film and recording industries ground to a standstill. Outside of education, most professional musicians suddenly found themselves without work. In academia, we sent our students home and transitioned all of our teaching from in-person to online, all within less than one week. At the Eastman School of Music, our primary goal was to find a way to complete the last half of the semester and to enable our graduating students to complete their degrees. As I look back on last spring, I would describe that period of time as having been in survival mode. 
Having made it to commencement in May, and with the realization that the impacts of the pandemic would be with us for months to come, we all had to make decisions about how we would deliver the curriculum once the fall semester commenced in September. There was a recognition that the teaching we did in the second half of the spring semester, while delivered via Zoom and other online platforms, really did not take full advantage of the capabilities of online teaching. In fact, it is much more accurate to describe the online curriculum delivery that occurred last spring as emergency remote instruction. However, over the summer, music faculties across the country and the globe invested their time learning new skills in order to effectively transfer their expertise as classroom and studio teachers to online teaching. In reality, the COVID crisis forced us to embrace online education much more vigorously and rapidly than we would have done otherwise. For the past 10 weeks at Eastman, even though we have been together in person for lessons, chamber music, and ensembles, all of our courses have been offered online so that those students who were unable to return to Rochester could still study and make progress toward their degrees. As the semester progressed, our faculty members and students continued to become more comfortable, knowledgeable, and adept at utilizing technology to advance their music teaching and learning. I'm assuming the same is true with our music colleagues around the world. From my perspective, while the pandemic created serious challenges on multiple levels, it also fostered a refreshed spirit of cooperation and collaboration that has been very special. This, my friends, is a window of opportunity for us all. Hopefully we have all observed and experienced a willingness of peers to work with each other to learn and improve. I have been privileged to join in many conversations with other deans and presidents of music institutions as we shared openly information being learned and the implications that information would have on the decisions being made at our home institutions. Likewise, associate deans and directors have been meeting every other week for months as they implement school processes and protocols at each of our institutions. The music directories of our orchestras, choirs, and wind ensembles have been meeting together and sharing ideas, as have colleagues in music theory, musicology, and other disciplines. Everyone has been willing and eager to share and learn from each other. In so many ways, I have found the spirit of cooperation to be inspiring and uplifting. While last spring might have been about survival, and this fall was largely focused on keeping our community safe in the face of the pandemic, we are now thinking about how to take advantage of all that we have been learning in regard to online music education and music making, and this increased desire to work collaboratively. The primary thing I want to suggest to all of you is that given our collective experience of delivering the curriculum online to our students, Expanding these opportunities to students at other institutions is now suddenly easier than in the past. With the advances of low latency technology and the development of asynchronous courses, students from anywhere in the world can conceivably take advantage of opportunities at each of our institutions. Here are four fairly simple examples. First, one of the positive results of COVID-19 has been the online presence of guest artists. A constant stream of guests from around the world presenting masterclasses, lectures, and performances nearly every week has been a tremendous boon for our students. While there is no substitute for interacting with a guest in person, the restrictions of time, space, and finances often limited the number of guests we could bring to campus in the past. With the advent of Zoom technology, Having a guest artist now only requires a commitment of one or two hours versus one or two days, plus travel, lodging, and other commitments. An example of how this has benefited our students at Eastman is that our jazz and contemporary media department has had guest artists nearly every Saturday since May. It would be very easy today for institutions to establish ongoing collaborations between faculty members. Whereas in the past, arranging for artists in two distant geographic locations to work with each other's students 
requires sophisticated technical requirements and support, such as Internet 2. Today, a decent web camera, microphone, and remote speakers opens up a world of opportunities. Two, it has never been easier to share one's music than it is today. Live stream performances, videos posted on YouTube and other platforms, and web-based concert series are readily available. At Eastman, we have been live streaming concerts for a number of years. Today, however, given, perhaps given the dearth of live performances, it is gratifying to observe that viewers are joining us from around the world. The reach of our, of our performances today is greater than at any other time in history. Should we choose to do so, institutions can form partnerships and agreements to cross promote each other's concerts. Doing so could expose each of our communities to exciting initiatives occurring at other institutions, which would perhaps ignite new ideas of things to do in our own home institutions. Third, with the wealth of courses now being offered online from each of our institutions, it would be relatively easy to enable students from one partner institution to enroll in classes offered at another partner's campus. While study abroad opportunities are currently on hold at my institution, and I assume many others, the opportunity for our students to study with professors and students at international partners could still provide unique and exciting experiences. And finally, many of our institutions now have some sort of online ensemble experience for students who cannot, who cannot be on campus and in person. Once again, enabling a student from an international partner to enroll and participate in this virtual ensemble is suddenly very easy. While the music may have stopped temporarily last spring, we have all found creative opportunities to engage our students and deliver the curriculum in new ways utilizing new technologies. In fact, as we continue to explore and push the boundaries of the virtual learning world, we will discover new and exciting modes of teaching, learning, and making music. It is my hope that that journey will include our mutual cooperation and collaboration in this new frontier. I encourage all of us to consider what opportunities we can make available to our faculty and students to collaborate and learn together with partner institutions around the globe. Doing so is simply a matter of willingness and agreement. Thank you. Uh, 罗西教授对于全球教育联盟的贡献同时呢我们全球教育联盟也非常愿意在即将明年到来的伊斯曼音乐学院的一百周年的建校纪念活动当中发挥作用在此呢我也预祝我们明年伊斯曼音乐学院的一百周年的校庆取得好的效果接下来
我们的理事一样，都对全球教育联盟提出了很多建设性的意见。我们在此也感谢他们今天线上来参加我们的会议。那么下面呢，我们也请安娜瑞德教授来就音乐交流的文化认知和转变来发表他的主旨发言和他的观点。有请。Uh, Professor Wang, Benjamin, Marco, um, thank you all for putting on this uh, fabulous uh, opportunity. And I greet you from Sydney, Australia at 2.27 a.m. Um, so uh, it's quite hard doing a day's work and then uh, having an evening conference. But what was delightful this evening was that in between my day of work and this conference, I attended a live performance. Um, so I, I can tell you that there's light at the end of the tunnel, um, that all of my students are back on a concert stage, recitals are happening in recital halls, and our professional musicians in our society are back in, on stages as well. So look forward to that. The buzz of excitement that sits around the concert hall at the moment is palpable with old friends meeting each other and new friends being created just for the joy of being together again. More importantly, um, I bring you greetings from the land in which I am residing. Um, and uh, so I'm sitting on the land of the Guringai people who are part of uh, the Aora Nation. Um, this is quite an important statement for an Australian to make um, because uh, the Indigenous Australians have been part of this land for millennia, whereas I'm quite a newcomer. Um, it's true to say that every other person um, in Australia, if you're not Indigenous, is an immigrant. Um, and every one of us brings with us an experience of lands and nations um, that are other than Australian. Um, the Indigenous Australians uh, had quite a different view of what music was about. Um, it was an embedded and embodied activity that was about the knowledge making of their entire society. They didn't have a written language. What they had was a combination of song, poetry, music, dance, body art, ground art, that was their means of being able to commute the, uh, communicate the essential knowledge of their society. It wasn't just love songs. It wasn't just about the beauty of trees. It was actually about where you would find your food. It would be about what the seasons were it would be about how you should behave with people who are strange to you. In other words, the importance of music was quite different from, in one sense, the entertainment that it's become in our particular era. Um, so knowing this makes me really wonder about what we do as music conservatoires. Um, and I ask this question particularly in the light of COVID because when the Europeans arrived in Australia, it was like the worst pandemic you could ever possibly imagine to find. Um, the people died in droves much greater um, than the deaths that are, are occurring now. Um, they uh, didn't know what was going on. There was no medicine. But the most dramatic thing that happened were the things that happened in the following 100 years, where their society was pulled apart by European perceptions of knowledge European perceptions of music, European perceptions of culture, European perceptions of education. So now we're in a position in contemporary Australia of reimagining and relearning what our past provided for us. So it's very wonderful now to discover that the uh, Indigenous music making included physics and astronomy and medicine um, and now uh, we can marry that information with what's happening um, environmentally and uh, fiscally, economically, culturally um, in Australia itself. Australia is quite unique uh, because as I said, uh, we're all immigrants here. Um, so we have with us also um, the nature and knowledge of many, many nations. Um, I play in a Chinese music ensemble. I have Chinese heritage myself. Um, and uh, we have so many uh, Chinese background people in Australia that it's um, quite wonderful. A concert tonight was pipa and guitar using um, an electronic interface. Um, and uh, that is now bringing music that has been traditional 
into a contemporary sense, contemporary world. So what's very exciting uh, at the moment is being able to find out uh, what are the musics that we have forgotten in the conservatory. Um, from my perspective, when I arrived at the Sydney Conservatory, we were a Western art music school. Um, now we've added to it contemporary music, um, digital music, theatre, scoring, all, all of the normal things that you'd be thinking of. But the most important thing is it's changed the dynamic of students that are involved in my institution from being, um, let's face it, a, a group of very wealthy students because they've been able to afford to play the violin since they were five years old. But now our curriculum is such that it embraces so many different styles and students from so many different backgrounds. So in other words, it's providing an emancipated learning activity for um, our broader society rather than just an elite society. Australia also has this wonderful position in the world um, because it's so far away, that's why we have concerts this week um, from everywhere else, but it, it's um, bang slap in the middle of um, the Asia Pacific, um, uh, the ASEAN areas, and with that becomes all forms of traditional high art music and all forms of traditional community music that we don't often have in Western style conservatories. And it's that at the moment that me, for me is making the concept of musical cultural exchange quite exciting. Uh, so in order to be able to do this, we need to privilege and understand what is traditional music in all areas. We need to understand what is uh, traditional high art music in all areas. And we have to understand that in the 21st century, in our technologically enhanced era, everything is open to us for a reinvention for, for our particular time. So one of the great worries of our era, apart from the obvious pandemic, are things like um, uh, climate change. Um, the things like um, economic development of um, nations who've just lost it for the last several centuries, the sustainability of cultures that would otherwise be lost uh, because we're becoming homogenized um, in our approach to the world in the 21st century. So our challenge is to be able to ensure that intangible cultural heritages of our past remain and are recorded, fostered, relearned in much the same way as we relearn Bach cantatas in order to be able to understand the depth of the knowledge of any society around us. And more importantly, we need to ensure that our students have the opportunity to reimagine these traditional musics in, co um, in concert with the music that they thought they might have wanted to learn when they came to a conservatory. So in terms of global mobility, um, I'm relishing this era where last year, physically, my students could join in with other students in the Asia Pacific area to create new music using all sorts of traditional instruments, new sound worlds, digitized, um, re-recorded, through composed, um, most extraordinary things that only young people can think of to do. And the result of that is that any student that has this experience of enrichment of culture from other places becomes a musician who will understand the depth and the importance of music making from uh, people all around the world. They will be the new creators of music and they will be the people who will be able to build cultural heritage for the 21st century that looks back in time to their nation and forwards in time uh, to the international world that we've become. So thank you very much for letting me have a go um, and to talk about what I think are important concerns um, that relate not only to pandemic, but the pandemics of our past eras, but into the positive use of our future. So thanks everybody. And thanks team for Gmail. You've all wonder wonderful people. So cool. Fitangai
呃院教授的发言。罗布森教授也是我们全球教育联盟的理事，他是在我们理事当中唯一一个音乐理论的专业方向的理这个专家。同时，今天也特别巧，就是今天在我们线上还有中国浙江音乐学院的院长王瑞教授参加了我们这样的会议。王瑞教授呢，也是中国。在音乐理论方面卓有成效的啊，而且是著名的一个专家和学者，也在此呢，我也向我们全球的呃音乐同行在此推荐他，也介绍他。呃，我们希望我们在全球教育联盟的建设过程当中，不能缺少音乐理论方面的探索和交流，使在音乐理论方面为我们全球音乐教育联盟的发展进行理论的支撑和保驾护航。我们相信，在今后的音乐理论方面，像我们中国浙江音乐学院院长王瑞这样的专家，像芝加哥大学音乐学院院长安妮·罗布森这样的音乐专家，都会对我们今后的发展起到积极的作用。那么现在呢，让我们有请安娜·罗布森教授，作为全球音乐教育联盟与跨机构音乐科研合作的主体发言，有请安妮·罗布森。Thank you, Professor Wang, and thank you very much for organizing this uh, excellent conference. Uh, the Global Music Education League is rightly ambitious in its desire to build a platform for the training of world-class musical talents and the promotion of scientific research, creation and performance, resources accumulation, and sharing communication and cooperation across musical genres and the cultures of different nations. The challenge is how the Jamel can facilitate these things among scores of institutions spread around the globe. It's clear that each member institution of the Jamel will have a role to play. For the most part, we are talking about music conservatories and universities with schools of music. Now I'm going to share my screen. And let me this and then go down. My own institution, the University of Chicago, does not offer performance degrees, although it maintains a vibrant and distinguished co curricular program in music performance in classical and traditional musics, including, as you can see, Afro Cuban music, Middle East music, South Asian music, and jazz. As well as Western based ensembles in chamber, choral, wind, and symphonic music. In addition, U Chicago specializes in training undergraduate students in the basics of musicology and music theory and in advanced training leading to the PhD in musicology, ethnomusicology, and music theory. This bifurcated focus of co curricular performance paired with intensive focus in music scholarship is the norm, not only at New Chicago, but also at most universities in the United States that do not have schools of music or conservatories. For this reason, it's appropriate, I think, for us to consider what role the Jamel might play in institutions such as these. I'll first describe the situation in the US and then I'll talk about the role I see that Jamel might play. In more than three decades that I've spent at Chicago, I've seen a remarkable growth in the study of music, not simply of the Western canon, but also of other world cultures at institutions across the US. To start with just one traditional music, we can trace the growth of the study of Chinese music in the United States, starting with a very important collection of Chinese musical scores housed at Harvard University. This collection is named for its founder, Professor Rulan Xiaopian, an American music ethnomusicologist who taught at Harvard from 1961 to 92 and who specialized in music of the Song Dynasty. The Pian collection includes a very rare Quinn anthology from the Ming Dynasty, one of just 19 known copies. Another 17th century book from the collection is an edition of the Chinese encyclopedia, Shi Lin Guangji, published in Japan in 1699. 
In addition to these rare books, the Pion collection includes several hundred field and commercial recordings and videos. In many ways, Professor Pion was the mother of Chinese music studies in the US. Among her students were Isabel Wong at the University of Illinois and Bell Young at the University of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has one of the strongest programs in Chinese ethnomusicology in North America. Its graduates are recognized internationally as leaders in the field. And more recently, other universities have developed important programs and are turning out excellent students. Lester Hu from Beijing, now an assistant professor at the University of California, Berkeley, completed his dissertation at Chicago in 2019, focusing on the 18th century reform of Chinese musical tuning known as 14 note temperament. Lester's a good example too of the international nature of education and music research in recent years. Here was a student from Beijing trained in the US who conducted research in the music of his homeland. But Lester is hardly the exception. Students are now extremely peripatetic and we at Chicago host graduate students who in recent years have come from many different places and have written on music from six continents. A typical example is Miriam Tripaldi, an Italian student who came to the University of Chicago to work on Russian opera and who recently defended her dissertation on opera in St. Petersburg in the late 18th century. The peripatetic and global nature of these students and so many others now studying in the US is a far cry from the more parochial aims of music education just four decades ago when I began my own training at Yale, where many students like myself studied the music of Western Europe. In fact, the work of most graduate students nowadays is global almost by definition. And the 21st century is a very good time to be conducting research across borders, even across continents, since technology has advanced to the point that students can carry out their work with such wonderful tools as Zoom, which we're using today, uh, which can connect classrooms across the globe, and digital archives that are often uh, very relevant for those working on dissertations. At the undergraduate level as well, most music programs in the US include training in both Western music and in at least one aspect of global music, now that ethnomusicology is well established in, on US campuses. With so much interest in global music among undergraduates and in global music PhD projects these days, an institution such as Jamel is particularly well poised to help facilitate this work. The question of funding quickly becomes important, of course. At this time, a professional music organization such as the American Musicological Society has only one endowment that helps its student members travel for research to parts of the world other than Western Europe, including China. This is the Harold Powers Travel Fund, founded in 2007. 12 graduate students so far have received this uh, award, including uh, Lester Hu, whom I just mentioned, who drew from this fund a couple of years ago to conduct his research in China. In addition to the Powers Fund, the American Council of Learned Societies has begun a new program sponsored by the Henry Luce Foundation and the ACLS, which is designed to encourage the vitality of China studies in the US through fellowships and grants to young scholars in the humanities and social sciences. This program makes three types of grants. There are pre-dissertation grants for research in China, enabling young researchers to make scholarly connections and learn about research happening in China. Second, there are postdoctoral early career fellowships which assist new PhDs in publishing their dissertations and embarking on new work. And finally, there are collaborative reading workshop grants that provide opportunities for scholars in different disciplines to share in-depth investigations of texts. And of course, what I've just showed you is just one example of funding for students and scholars between two particular nations. There are others that provide support for research in the countries of other member institutions of the Jamel. But we notice that the work of the ACLS China grants is not geared specifically toward music. They support research in many different fields. 
This is why we need help in identifying and publicizing avenues of funding and much else in order to achieve a truly global form of music education and research among our member institutions. I believe that Jamel can help in promoting more and better connections and collaborations in education in music history and music research. It could offer ways for all of us to begin to communicate better with one another. I suggest that each one of us, faculty and students, seek out a teacher or scholar from a Jamel member institution in another country who teaches or does research in our area and begin to converse regularly with him or her through email, Zoom, and other means. We should discuss what teaching methods we use, how and where we conduct our research, what resources we use, what the avenues for publication are. Through the Jamel, we should maintain a list of travel and research grants, uh, specifically in the field of music that our institutions and our professional societies can provide to try to enable better exchanges of both students and faculty. Jamel itself, I hope might be able to establish a fund for research and performance travel and scholarly exchange. We should publish through Jamel guidelines for student exchange and for visiting scholars. We should announce lists of courses as it has been mentioned that we're offering in music history, music theory and ethnomusicology through Jamel. And we should work with our administrations, as Jamal said, uh, to create opportunities for cross registration of students among member institutions, leading both to live visits and participation in courses through Zoom classrooms. It is through the work and camaraderie of the Jamel, I believe, that truly productive communication and collaboration can occur. Thank you very much. Fe 再一次向安妮罗伯森表示感谢本杰明先生对我们全球教育联盟是人类文明的瑰宝中西方音乐的经典音乐并没有真正成为引领大众精神文化的主流与广大的听众的现代
比较欠缺。更为遗憾的是，不仅仅在中国，而且在全球，我们都看到，有一部分人把我们作为实验风格的十二音序列创作技术，当做一种普世及先进的。其实啊，这种现象对当代音乐文化素质的提升收效甚微。已经形成了不好听、不爱听，甚至听不懂的这样的一个独特现象。因此呢，我们应当认清世界艺术发展的主流大道，传承世界丰富多彩的传统音乐文化，在融汇和贯通中创造出经典音乐新的风貌，普惠当代大众。再一个呢，我想提到，就是针对全球不发达地区，我刚才讲到的是发达地区。但是在不发达地区是什么样子呢？就是素质音乐教育的工作依然呢意义非凡，有很多音乐特色和民族地区文化浓郁的国家，目前还都缺少对自己本民族音乐文化的教育，而且很多地区的人民还认为音乐只是感官的娱乐品。如果人类音乐仅仅是消费品，而没有强调它真正净化心灵和塑造人格的话，显然是无法达到提高人类高尚素质和普及教育文化的这样一个文明的目的。同时呢，我们在版权方面也应该有所作为。我们所有的音乐家都是各个国家举足轻重的艺术家和有影响的人物。我们实际也真正的看到，版权是维护尊重艺术家创作尊严的重要保障。但是，也因为版权设置的科学性的问题。使得不发达地区由于贫穷而无法支付费用，而造成对音乐普及和欣赏存在困难。这使得不发达地区的和贫困地区的人们啊，无法真正欣赏优质的音乐作品。因此呢，某些音乐版权啊，应该向不发达地区开放音乐及音乐作品的欣赏。人类文明发展过程中经历了几个非常重要的转折点，从农耕经济、工业经济、知识经济到信息化的今天，其实每一次转折啊，都因认为是劳动方式的变化而进化了音乐及各门艺术的发展和变化，它也彻底影响了每一个阶段的艺术传播方式。那么，面对今天的世界，我们如何传播经典艺术呢？所以。我认为，通过艺术家身体力行的志愿服务，通过全球化的网络体系，并且配合版权的相应的扶贫政策，真正让不发达地区的人在自己的沃土中提升艺术修养，让走进发达地区的人有文化，让永远扎根不发达地区的人也有文化。当文化没有死角的时候。才能成为万众山水有灵性，人世人间有温度。当前新环境下，音乐应该积极发挥二十一世纪的新作用。各国音乐家、音乐教育家在音乐理论方面，要积极的引领新时代音乐艺术如何走进千家万户的潮流。在音乐创作方面，要努力创作出包含各国民族音乐元素的。可听性、可记忆性强的优秀作品，在音乐表演方面积极开展殿堂以及田野都可以分享的艺术传播方式，在音乐教育方面构建适应于音乐素质标准的教育课程体系等等。总的来说，我们全球教育联盟就是在此基础上要不断的发展。音乐的高精尖人才的培养，同时也注意音乐教育方面的普及和传播。艺术实践路漫漫，乐教之途啊，其修远，吾辈将上下而求索。呃，由于本杰明先生在第一个单元主持的非常优秀，他的时间把握的非常好，所以我也向他学习，我也把握我们。短暂的时间内，能够充分发挥我们每一个发言人的充分的内容，所以在我的这个单元里面，时间我没有超时，所以我们把下一个单元要
转交给我们下一位这个主持人。我们在下一个单元里面将会有我们全球教育联盟在合作办学和人联合人才培养方面做出了积积极贡献的一些学校，包括英国皇家伯明翰医院学院的前院长朱利安·威伯。啊，包括意大利塔迪尼音乐学院的院长罗伦佐，啊，卡帕尔多，包括英国约克大学的音乐学院院长艾尼什，包括美国克利夫兰音乐学院院长保罗·霍尔格霍格尔，包括美国皮鲍里音乐学院院长啊，费莱德·布朗斯坦等等，他们都是在全球音乐教育联盟当中发挥积极作用的音乐学院的院长，所以我们下面请。芬兰赫尔辛基艺术大学校长卡尔洛·希尔德主持下一个单元，谢谢。Thank you very much,、uh, Professor Wang, and、um, I'm concerned,、uh, especially thinking of the our colleagues in the East.、Uh, there's been a long day already, and we're slightly behind the schedule. So, without further ado, I'll. Give the floor to Julian Lloyd Webber,、uh, who will speak about global music education's future within and outside the league. Please. Nihal and hello. Already, there have been some really fascinating、uh, discussions today.、Um, that could almost some of them be called controversial. So it's going to be very interesting to see how tomorrow, the rest of today, and tomorrow work out. Now. Before beginning today, I should make it clear that I'm speaking in my new capacity of emeritus professor at Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, as I've stepped down from the role of principal last September after five extremely exciting years. Firstly, today I want to thank President Wang Li Guang for the extraordinary efforts made by President Wang himself and his entire team at the China Conservatory to ensure that this important Global Music Education League conference is taking place this year during this exceptionally difficult time. I believe that this momentous year of 2020 has shown yet again how essential it is for nations across the world to work together. And to share and exchange information and knowledge for the benefit of all. And once this pandemic has passed, the Gmail can be a vital repository of information concerning the ways our different institutions have responded to and learned from this unprecedented challenge. During my time as principal at Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, we developed a strong and lasting partnership with China Conservatory. Over the past few years. We've enjoyed extremely productive exchanges, with two conductors and a composer from China Conservatory being awarded scholarships to study at RBC in the UK, and one of RBC's own former students is now playing French horn in conductor Xiao En's new orchestra, Academia China, a great professional opportunity for our student, which came about entirely through RBC's growing relationship with China Conservatory. Through all our global partnerships, our organisations can learn so much from each other. Speaking personally, and quite a few people are today, I would like to see more Western students spending periods of study in the Far East. Following on from the earlier discussion, it's no accident to note that so many of the top international music competitions are consistently won by Far Eastern instrumentalists, and this has much to do with their impressive work ethic. They are the ones who will be found in practice rooms late into the evening, while other nationalities might be adopting a more holistic approach to their learning, perhaps taking in other art forms such as drama or literature, rather than concentrating solely on the number of hours they practice in individual instruments. As I've said, we've got so much to learn from each other, for a nation's culture is its most defining characteristic. And culture can unite nations like nothing else. In the post-COVID era, the Gmail can play a pivotal role in gathering data from all of its members on how each institution handled the pandemic and what they learned from it. For example, what have we learned from the vast amount of online teaching that's been delivered? And what have we learned from all the wonderfully imaginative online projects which have been created by individual students? 
And which aspects of this outpouring of creativity from our students should we be encouraging and developing for the benefit of their futures? The gathering and sharing of this kind of information can be immensely helpful towards providing a basis for best practice and important research. I'm very pleased to see that tomorrow the conference will be holding a discussion on early, earlier years teaching. As a result of the pandemic, I'm sure we will all be aware that governments across the world will be looking for any ways they can to save money. And as so often in the past, the arts will be seen as an easy target. As the principles of the world's leading music colleges, it falls to us to make the strongest possible case for music education and to ensure that future generations do not miss out on the opportunity to experience and study our wonderful art form. Gmail can play a crucial part in helping to make our case globally. And I look forward to joining with you tomorrow to discuss the promotion of quality music education from early years to student graduation. Thank you, Sheshe. Thank you so much, Julian. Um, wise words about how much we can learn from each other and how important it is that we join forces in keeping music on the agenda and um, available for, for everyone. Um, going on, please let me introduce Lorenzo Capaldo, president of the Conservatorio di Musica Giuseppe Tartini di Trieste, who is going to speak about um, an event, Gmail event in Trieste, Claire did jazz. Please, Lorenzo, the floor is yours. Do we have Lorenzo? If there are some technical challenges, I suggest we switch the order and try to get Lorenzo online uh, after a while. So if, if it's okay, I would suggest that we take Ein Schell from um, University of York instead uh, before Lorenzo and then try to uh, correct the, the technical issues uh, meanwhile. So, um, we're going to hear about transnational joint training of talents and sharing of educational resources at the Department of Music, University of York, UK. Um, Thank please. you very much. Um, and, uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much to the conference organizers for inviting me to speak. I'm Anya Shiel, and I'm head of the music department at the University of York in the UK. I have some slides which I would like to share with you. So if you just give me one moment, I'll bring up those slides. And um, here we go. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, just for those of you who uh, don't know the University of York, I want to introduce it very quickly. The University of York is a member of the Russell Group of 24 leading uh, UK universities, meaning that we are among the most research intensive and international universities in the UK. Founded in 1963 with just a few hundred students, we now have almost 19,000 students from over 150 countries. So it's a truly international institution. In the music department, we have 197 undergraduates, 171 MA students, and 73 research students. So small by conservatory standards, but quite large by music uh, university departments. 55% of our students are um, home students, 45% international from 21 different countries. And our programs include BA in music and music and sound recording, um, MA programs in MA music, various different pathways, which you see here, a very successful MA music education focusing on instrumental and vocal teaching, community music 
music production and we teach at PhD level. PhD can be through musicology, performance, composition, music psychology or music technology. Our partners include China Conservatory of Music, Tianjin Conservatory of Music, Wuhan Conservatory of Music, and I'm happy to say the University of the Arts Helsinki, plus other institutions in France, Sweden and China, in addition to membership of the Global Music Education League, which we are, of course, very pleased to be part of. So to get on to um, the question of transnational training, I want to focus in this very short presentation on our two plus one MA arrangements with China Conservatory of Music and Tianjin Conservatory of Music, and to give you two examples of how this can work and how we benefit from the um, mobility of students between these institutions. So my first example of transnational training is our current MA student, Wang Weishuan. Weishuan is a BA graduate of China Conservatory of Music, and she's continued her studies there at MA level. This year, as part of our two plus one arrangement with CCM, and thanks to the Global Music Education League, she's following the musicology pathway of our MA music. And I should add that um, at CCM, Wei Xuan specializes in Chinese music research and therefore has a different emphasis during her year in New York. At the moment, she's focusing on the musicology of Western music and has an opportunity to explore some repertoire and approaches to music that we certainly hope will add value to her MA experience. My second example of transnational training is our current PhD student, Zhang Yao. Yao is a prize winning MA graduate of Tianjin Conservatory of Music and the University of York, thanks to our two plus one arrangement with Tianjin. She is currently studying at PhD level in York and is funded by the China Scholarship Council. Her PhD is on Benjamin Britten's opera, The Turn of the Screw. And in our department, she can benefit from expertise in English music and opera studies while enjoying good access to necessary sources. Now, we are clear that our department benefits greatly from strong students such as these. And we greatly value our partnerships with prestigious Chinese conservatories and the opportunity to participate in transnational training of such talents. Finally, um, very swiftly, music at the University of York belongs to a consortium of UK partners in a project known as Ensemble Plus. This project involves investment in technology that allows us to hold workshops in one institution with live participation by students in many other institutions. The technology reduces latency problems and allows for transmission of high quality audio and visual streams. The project is not long established and ironically COVID has slowed it down, but COVID also shows us that this type of project is incredibly important and that physical location is no longer such a determining factor as was the case before. And a conference such as this on Zoom also teaches us much about the possibility of sharing of ideas and best practice, which indeed we already have heard a lot about. And I look forward to hearing much more about this this afternoon and tomorrow. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and Sheil, and we'll trying to go back to Lorenzo once more. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Welcome. The floor is yours. Lorenzo, thank please. you. Thank you very much. Yeah. President Wang Li Wang, distinguished colleagues, my dear friends, it's nice to see you again and thank you for the opportunity. We are all going through a challenging time and what is worse, all performing arts are living even a more difficult situation. Empty classrooms, empty studios and stages. The shutdown or reduction in activities in order to meet the requirements to prevent the virus from spreading had a dramatic effect on all the cultural sector. We could say that due to the global health crisis, creativity as such is no longer valued as a skill and the entire world of arts is losing, is losing social relevance. That is why 
in the COVID-19 era, music education requires not only a good leap of faith, but also to drastically reshape many of age-old ways of training musicians. But in every crisis lies great opportunity. Accordingly to face pandemic, we were forced to think how to revitalize music education. And the solution was to make long distance learning with a new didactic approach based on connections and video calls. Speaking of which, I am proud to recall the wonderful experience we had in Trieste just one year ago. Thanks to President Wang Li Wang, in collaboration with China Conservatory of Music, Conservatorio Tertini held the first European meeting of GMEF. The event took place in June 2019 and was supported by Italian Ministry of Education and by the regional government. President Li Wang could not come, but he sent us an appreciated video message. We successfully discussed about GMEF's perspectives and above all, we introduced GMEF's opportunities not only to national and local authorities, but also to our students. In the last day, we held a special concert. It was an interactive concert event, which in my opinion, could be a starting point for the next Gmail's activities. As a matter of fact, the concert was performed by young musicians coming from the different countries members of Gmail. And that is good as such. We all want our students to share experiences. And I assure you, seeing young musicians who had never met before performing together and becoming friends was amazing. But the most interesting fact was that the concert included the remote participation of another jazz musician from Vienna, linked together with the ensemble by Lola, the low latency system projected by Conservatorio Tertini that allows distance performance. It was just as if we were in Fiesta playing on the same stage. Now, I would like to show you some images of the event. I have a, a short video so you can understand what I'm saying. It, Thank you. I think we could improve learning and distance performing in music education. It would be great if our students with the tools of the technology would join in a global concert to support the fight of coronavirus. Let's think about it. In a world where entire degrees can be earned via internet, GMAN can have a pivotal role in developing educational resources and in sharing different methodical tools in order to achieve the aim of our organization, a world-class academic community. Thank you for the attention.
Thank you so much, Lorenzo, for reminding us of the, of the technical opportunities we have for collaboration and also the wonderful time in Trieste. Uh, memories from a time when we still could meet each other in person. Um, and then let's go forward to Fred Bronstein, Dean from the Peabody Institute at the John Hopkins University, who is going to talk about the performing arts in a post-COVID world. Fred, please. Do we have Fred with us? I think you skipped me, Carlo. Okay, uh, Fred is not present. Okay, so then we will, um, Paul Hogel, um, president from uh, the Cleveland Institute of Music, sorry. I missed you. I jumped uh, directly from from um, to to the next presentation, forgetting you. Paul Hogel is going to talk to us about an observation, a fact, a prediction, and a caution. Please. I bring you the greetings from the campus of the Cleveland Institute of Music in Cleveland, Ohio where our students have been assembled for in-person training since August 10th. And we will mercifully finish the semester this Friday. It is my distinct pleasure to continue to thank President Wong and the leadership of the China Conservatory of Music for their partnership, their respect, and their commitment to international music education. I would also like to thank Carlo for his very fine moderator skills and regret that I was not able to visit you last summer. When it comes to CIM's experience sharing the GMEL joint training practice, I will focus my remarks on the four points mentioned, an observation followed by a fact, a prediction, and finally a caution. My observation is that on our campuses these past number of months, the COVID virus has distinguished many master teachers and administrators from their peers. While there has been nothing ideal about the current learning environment, the virus has revealed the underlying strength of our schools. If we are embedded in a larger university as some are, it is confirmed how far our universities are willing to go or not to go to preserve our practice area. For a school like CIM, whose priority is gathering the world's most talented classical music students to fulfill their performance potential, being together on campus has been essential. I have learned from the persistence and the uncommon flexibility of teaching artists like Sergei Babion and Ilya Kahler, Antonio Pampabaldi and Jamie Laredo. You see, the virus has nurtured a learning environment free from many of the distractions that plague young classical musicians and their students are making remarkable, breathtaking progress. One great epiphany for our academic leadership has been mentioned today, and it's how advantageous it is for elite students of performance to have greater control of their schedule through a blend of synchronous and asynchronous courses. In the classroom, as well as in the studio, I'm very pleased to report that our students from the China Conservatory of Music are holding up very well under CIM's rigor and high expectations. This leads to a fact followed by a prediction. In America, there is a well-documented 15% enrollment cliff coming in the next five to seven years, primarily caused by declining domestic and international birth rates and inconsistent international visa policies. According to one study, this permanent reduction in the number of students seeking higher education might cause 50% of American colleges and universities in every tier to close or go bankrupt in the next decade. 
So for those of you wondering how an enrollment cliff affects music programs, let me put it as clearly as possible. The dual threat of a declining number of students and schools fighting for their own existence will create a highly leveraged buyer's market for prospective students. It will also trigger irrational short-term behavior by schools competing for students. All the evidence points to this outcome. Soon, no student pursuing a college education in an area of high specialization or mastery will pay for that degree. CIM will be forced to fight over a dwindling number of students, many not prepared for a conservatory level training and not likely to be successful as professional classical musicians. But my prediction is rich with abundant hope. I've been told by a wide range of professionals just among Americans largest orchestras that within five years, between 400 and 600 members of America's top orchestras are planning to retire, giving way to the largest number of ensemble openings in the modern history of American orchestras. To me, this is very exciting news. I am not entirely sure how to interpret the conservatory enrollment pipeline in the context of the looming enrollment cliff but it would be irrational not to think that there isn't some eventual correlation. Profound career opportunities are on the horizon if our graduates are ready. And finally, a caution. As I listen to prospective students online, watch recorded and live lessons and hear virtual masterclasses and auditions, I have come to the conclusion that there are too many students studying music performance with a dream of being the next classical superstar. And based on their playing, I must conclude that they are being taught by teachers incapable of empowering them to achieve their dreams and potential. This is my caution. In the face of declining enrollments resulting in unprecedented competition, we must ask ourselves, what kind of conservatory music school or department of music can each of us successfully be? Let's face it, master teachers develop elite performers and the supply of master teachers is by definition limited. There are some schools whose current leadership is all in when it comes to the music program. And by all men, I mean unapologetic investment in building scholarships and an environment of rigorous excellence. Among the thousands of conservatories and schools of music on earth, many though live a kind of hand to mouth existence where under resourced faculty and staff coexist with students in pursuit of careers many of them will never achieve. Deciding how to have bilateral conversations through GMEL at the international level and locally at the school level about the future is complicated. Some schools will decide to quadruple their enrollment. Others will determine that survival and in fact thriving might mean a substantial reduction in enrollment. Another group will decide that the enrollment cliff is fake news that the central administration doesn't value music and everything will be fine if we would stop talking about cliffs instead of clefts, past as prologue. At the Cleveland Institute of Music, we have adopted the aggressive posture that thriving depends on being materially smaller and substantially less expensive. Already exceptionally competitive, we will reduce our enrollment by 40% to achieve increased selectivity. My caution about the role of music in higher education and international exchange is that we first have to actually exist in order to have a role or enjoy exchange at all. The unanswered question is this, what choices will the thousands of entities around the world who serve the pursuit of music make? In the immortal words of Ayn Rand, quote, every man 
builds his world in his own image. He has the power to choose, but no power to escape the necessity of choice. We must all choose wisely. Thank you all for these words of uh, some of the core issues we have ahead of us and that we need to address uh, both within our own institutions, but also between us in, in these international contexts. Um, and then uh, to Fred Bronstein, um, Dean of the Peabody Institute at the John Hopkins University, uh, talking about the performing arts in a post COVID world. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen, if I may. Hold on. That did not. I hope you can see this now. Um, thank you very much. It's nice to be with everyone this morning. And um, I want to add my thanks to President Wong for uh, organizing this wonderful uh, series of events and conversations. Um, I am going to just take a few minutes today to talk a little bit about the way we see the, the way I am seeing the um, impact of COVID on um, the immediate future, but also more importantly, the long-term future. Um, and I'm gonna focus a little bit on the United States today, if I can. Um, there was a study that was done this past summer by the Brookings Institute. The Brookings Institute is, a, um, if those of you not familiar with it, is a major think tank in the United States. And uh, they looked at the immediate impact of COVID-19 on the performing arts across our country. And um, not surprisingly, the, the, the impact short term was devastating. 2.7 million jobs lost, 150 billion in sales and revenues lost, uh, much of this in the fine arts. So orchestras, opera, chamber music. Um, and so it, it, you know, those of us that are in this business, you know, look at this and say, what is the, what is the, um, what is the long-term implication of this? And I think what is clear, at least what the Brookings Institute study made clear was that this recovery from this was actually gonna require um, a sustained and, and systematic and long-term effort actually to rebuild. And I think that, you know, the question, the question for me in this has been, you know, how does this mesh and intersect with other trends that we've experienced here in the United States? So uh, those of you that are, that are in the States will recognize the fact that we faced audience development trends that are not favorable in the performing arts. This is just a study that was done by the NEA National Endowment for the Arts that showed a you know, substantial decrease in um, the number of adults attending classical music events. Um, and this next slide just adds in 2017. And while the decline hasn't been quite as much, it is still a substantial decline. And if one goes back to the 1980s or 1990s, the decline is even more steep. This is just showing the decline from 2002. Now I wanna to add to this, you know, another issue that intersects with all of this in terms of trends. And that is to say with what has historically been the lack of diversity uh, and the presence of, 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 of black musicians and Latinx musicians, um, in uh, traditional classical ensembles in the United States. So for example, you can see here the statistics um, that we still have very low representation of, um, of musicians of color and specifically black and brown musicians in our professional orchestras. And these orchestras still largely perform works of European origin and our attendees are still overwhelmingly white. Those are just the facts. And so, for me, the question becomes, and this is just, I'll show this also, this, this tells you the story of what will the demographic changes that are happening in the United States. So we will go from being 
essentially two thirds white and one third non-white within the next 30, 40 years to being the opposite. And you know, that's inverted, we're one third white and two thirds non-white. So when, I think when you look at all, we take all of this together, you take the, you take the, um, the impact of COVID and you take trends that have been happening here really for several decades now, and you look at demographic trends and shifts coming, these are the questions that have come to mind, you know, for me. So, so when we look at all of this, what are going to be the long-term impact? What's the long-term impact of COVID-19? We know what the short-term impact is. I don't worry as much about that. I'm more concerned about what the long-term impact is. And the question is, is it, for me, is it, is this, a, is it, is COVID-19 going to be a, is it an interrupter or is it really an accelerator of trends that have, that have been happening? And how do we address that? How do we address that in the training of our students? Um, and what's the potential impact on, you know, on, the, on our industry uh, and therefore on the students that we're recruiting and training? And maybe most importantly, how do we react to this um, and stay at the forefront of it without overreacting to it too? How do we find that right balance? So at Peabody, over the last several years, we've been very focused on, on rethinking how we train our students for a, for a you know, different kind of environment long, really before COVID. Um, and we've redone our whole sort of career services area. We now have a required curriculum that we call the breakthrough curriculum that has a suite of three courses that, are, that are, all of our students must take. And it builds skills in, you know, in exploring broad and creative and different ways of building a career. It, it, uh, you build portfolios, you build digital portfolios, and you learn how to develop and, and, and really sell or pitch an idea, whether it's to a funder or to you know, whoever it might be. We're doing a series that um, try to highlight the changes in the performing arts world, and we're incenting our students with grants and our faculty as well to develop creative and interesting projects um, and, and different ways of seeing careers. Um, the diversity piece, and again, I, you know, I come back to this because it is so important, particularly in this country, um, both the, the early pipeline to developing uh, young artists of color to, you know, to moving into the professional world. And so we have focused a lot, we are focusing a lot on building an early pipeline of, of young um, African American and Latinx students here in Baltimore. Uh, and bringing them into the conservatory and sending them on to other conservatories. Uh, we have um, focused very extensively on building our own uh, diversity and our own cohort of conservatory students. We're now 17% what we call underrepresented minorities, so black and brown students at Peabody, and we have 14% of our faculty is now um, underrepresented minorities. Um, we're investing a lot in this area uh, in diversity funds, and we are taking the events of last April here in the United States and some of the, 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 the significant racial and, and uh, racism issues that, that have not just surfaced, but are, have become even more intense over the last year and really tried to uh, address how we as an institute are, are, are meeting those challenges. We are, this is all coming together in a, in a think tank that we are, we have put together um, that uh, is looking at these issues. Uh, we're looking at what Peabody has done in our curriculum over the last several years to prepare 21st century musicians. We're looking at what is the impact of COVID now? And again, coming back to this question, is, is, it, a, is it really an interrupter or is it just a, you know, a really significant accelerator of things that were already happening? And third, how do we respond to this? You know, I'd like to think Peabody, we've been fairly bold in taking on some of these challenges, but I think that, you know, the question for me, for us now is, do we need to be even more bold in how we see this uh, in light of what's happened? Um, as an outcome of this work that we're doing with the Think Tank, we will also host in February a, an international symposium that will um, address these issues, um, and we're still in the process of putting this together, but I'll be, uh, look forward to getting out additional information about this. So um, just to conclude, I would say that, you know, this may sound like a pessimistic view, but I actually believe it's not. I think that, you know, 
as challenging as COVID has been, as and even with the challenges that I think it presents um, to the performing arts um, everywhere, but I think you know what I know best is in the United States right now. Um, I think there's an opportunity here for us to think and rethink how we train our students for this very different world, uh, which I think is so critical. Thank you very much. And I, again, I appreciate the time and the um, being able to participate in today's forum. Thank you so much um, for highlighting the importance to take this moment to re rethink how we educate our students and what kind of a world uh, we can imagine uh, uh, looking at the long time consequences, as you told, um, are so important to think about. So um, we're ending this session uh, here and it's been really interesting to listen to all of you, Julian, starting with highlighting the importance of, of learning from each other, meeting different culture also for us Westerners to spend some time uh, in, in the Far East. Um, Lorenzo giving a practical example of what we can do with the technical um, uh, tools we have available in the network like Gmail. Ainshiel giving us another practical example of, of the transnational programs, joint tra training programs and the possibilities of them. Paul taking us back to the crucial uh, fundamental things we need to consider when there are so many uh, sort of things that, that institutions have to struggle with uh, uh, at the same time as we have to develop uh, in a world with a lot of challenges. And Fred fin finally then uh, looking at the long time, long term uh, consequences and highlighting the importance for us to come together and, and analyze the situation and think forward of the whole sector and how we can help it to develop and rebuild after the, the, the pandemic. So thank you very much for these really interesting presentations. And uh, then I give over to our host, oh, hosts. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 智慧是充满了智慧我们所有人的发言的内容在这里还要特别感谢本杰明的主持特别感谢卡尔洛希尔德的主持感谢贾马尔洛希的主持第一天的精彩预示着我们今天的会议年会会取得很好的成功那我们期待明天我们继续进行